Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, I have a story on chemical compounds found on an asteroid. Katie Weaver reports on the Ringling Circus, and Faith Perlo answers a question from a listener. Later, we hear part one of the Diamond Lens by Fitz James O'Brien. But first, two chemical compounds necessary to living organisms. Have been found in material from the asteroid Ryugu. The Japanese spacecraft Hayabusa 2 collected the materials and sent them back to Earth. The findings from an international group of scientists support the idea that some elements of life arrived on Earth from asteroids billions of years ago. Scientists said on Tuesday they discovered uracil and niacin in rocks collected by a Japanese space agency aircraft. The samples came from two places on Ryugu in 2019. Uracil is one of the chemicals present in RNA. RNA is a molecule carrying directions. For building and operating living organisms, niacin, also called vitamin B3 or nicotinic acid, is important for metabolism. The Ryugu samples traveled 250 million kilometers back to Earth and returned to Earth's surface in a container. The container landed in December 2020. In Australia, scientists for a long time have aimed to understand the conditions necessary for life on Earth after it formed about 4.5 billion years ago. Bodies like comets, asteroids, and meteorites struck the Earth at that time. The new findings support the theory that those bodies provided the planet. With compounds that helped create the first organisms, scientists had found organic molecules in meteorites found on Earth, but it was not clear whether those space rocks had been affected by Earth's environment after landing. We suspect uracil and niacin had a role in evolution on Earth. And possibly for the emergence of first life, said astrochemist Yasuhira Oba of Hokkaido University in Japan. An astrochemist studies chemistry in places other than Earth. He is lead writer of the research published in Nature Communications. RNA is short for ribonucleic acid. Uracil is necessary to form RNA, a group of molecules present in all living cells, and very important for the activity of genes. RNA is similar to DNA, the molecules that carry an organism's genetic instructions. Niacin is important for metabolism and can help produce the energy that powers living organisms. Oba said uracil and niacin were found at both landing sites on Ryugu. The asteroid is about 900 meters in diameter and is considered a near-Earth asteroid. The amounts of the compounds were higher at one of the places than the other on the asteroid. A famous American circus has been reimagined and reborn. Without the use of animals in the show, the family event now centers on humans performing tricks. 
including walking on a wire and flying through the air on a trapeze high above the ground. Feld Entertainment owns the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. The company talked to the Associated Press about what people can expect to see at the traveling show in 2023. It opens in September. A group of 75 performers from 18 countries will carry out the acts, which combine artistry, skill, and strength. Some will perform jumps, runs, and other tricks on a wire high above the ground. The wire is stretched into a triangular path more than seven and a half meters up in the air. Flying trapeze artists will also cut through the air way up high, flipping as they move. Others perform acts on self-turning wheels, bicycles, unicycles, and skateboards. The greatest show on earth, as the company calls it, opens its 2023 season in Bossier City, Louisiana. It will hold shows in nine other states through the end of the year, including Ohio, Missouri, Maryland, and Oklahoma. It restarts in 2024 in Florida, home to Feld Entertainment. Feld Entertainment says it aimed to create a completely new kind of circus. We knew we were going to come back. We didn't know exactly how, says Kenneth Feld, chair and chief of Feld Entertainment. It took us a long time to really delve in and take a look at Ringling in different ways. It became a reimagination a rethinking of how we were going to do it. The circus closed in 2017 after years of decreasing sales and protests over the use of animals in the circus. People for the ethical treatment of animals praised the animal-free reform. The new production design includes movable stairs and two main stages. Crowds watching will have a 360-degree view with live camera feeds and virtual reality. Juliet Feld Grossman is Chief Operating Officer of Feld Entertainment. She said, We have so much activity and action so we want to make sure that we never miss the big moments in the show. The reimagined show extends the circus's long history. The Ringling Circus was around before automobiles, airplanes, or movies. It first opened in 1871. Hello, this week on Ask a Teacher. We will answer a question about start, begin, and commence. Dear VOA, please let me know the difference between begin, start, and commence, and their usage. Regards, Saeed from Iran. Thanks for this great question, Saeed. These words have similar meanings but the difference lies in how formal they are and their usage. Let's take a closer look at each one. Let's start with start. Start can either be a verb or a noun. As a verb, start means to happen or come into being from a particular point in time. I always start my day with a cup of tea. Julie started teaching last year. 
As a noun, start has two meanings. It can be the point in time when something happens or begins. The start of the race is downtown. When is the start of the budget year? Another meaning is a movement that is sudden or surprising. Guinea pigs have sudden starts called popcorning, like jumping in the air. We also use start to talk about things like machines and business. My computer will not start. She started her own business by creating videos on YouTube. In comparison to the other words, began and commence, start is the most informal of the three. Begin means the same thing as start, but remember that begin has different spelling in the past tenses. Began and begun. Here are some examples. Regina began as an actor before changing her career to become a director. I have begun to work on the class project, but I have yet to finish it. In language, sometimes we say a word begins with a certain letter of the alphabet. We also use it to describe when someone starts to speak. I cannot wait for Friday, she began. This work week felt so long. Commence means to start or begin. The difference is that commence is the most formal of the three. We usually use commence when talking about a ceremony or a project. The graduation ceremony commences at one in the afternoon. The groundbreaking for the new building will commence in the morning. Spring commenced two days ago. Please let us know if these explanations and examples have helped you, Saeed. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. You just heard Faith Perlow present this week's Ask a Teacher. Welcome back, Faith. Thanks for having me back, Dan. This week, you compared three words that have the same meaning. Begin, start, and commence. I wanted to ask you about the last one, commence. What is a commencement ceremony? Does that have anything to do with something that commences? This is an awesome question, Dan. A commencement ceremony is where graduates of university receive their diplomas after they have finished their requirements. So it happens at the end of their college career? Yes, so that's the confusing part. We associate commencement with the end of college. But it has its roots in new beginnings, actually in medieval Europe. After a scholar or student graduated, they could then teach their subject to others. The commencement is the start of their teaching, hence commence teaching, commencement. So in modern times, we can think of commencements as ceremonies for graduates to start their careers. Yes. Even though graduation is an ending or completing of a degree, a commencement ceremony is a way to celebrate a new beginning in life after graduation. This was an interesting topic, Faith. Thanks for joining me again. You're welcome, Dan. See you next week. Now, the special English program, American Stories. Our story today is called The Diamond Lens. It was written by Fitzjames O'Brien. We will tell the story in two parts. Now, here is Morris Joyce with part one of The Diamond Lens. When I was 10 years old, one of my older cousins gave me a microscope. The first time I looked through its magic lens, the clouds that surrounded my daily life rolled away. I saw a universe 
of tiny living creatures in a drop of water. Day after day, night after night, I studied life under my microscope. The fungus that spoiled my mother's jam was, for me, a land of magic gardens. I would put one of those spots of green mold under my microscope and see beautiful forests where strange silver and golden fruit hung from the branches of tiny trees. I felt as if I had discovered another Garden of Eden. Although I didn't tell anyone about my secret world, I decided to spend my life studying the microscope. My parents had other plans for me. When I was nearly 20 years old, they insisted that I learn a profession. Even though we were a rich family, and I really didn't have to work at all. I decided to study medicine in New York. This city was far away from my family, so I could spend my time as I pleased. As long as I paid my medical school fees every year, my family would never know I wasn't attending any classes. In New York, I would be able to buy excellent microscopes and meet scientists from all over the world. I would have plenty of money and plenty of time to spend on my dream. I left home with high hopes. Two days after I arrived in New York, I found a place to live. It was large enough for me to use one of the rooms as my laboratory. I filled this room with expensive scientific equipment that I did not know how to use. But by the end of my first year in the city, I had become an expert with the microscope. I also had become more and more unhappy. The lens in my expensive microscope was still not strong enough to answer my questions about life. I imagined there were still secrets in nature that the limited power of my equipment prevented me from knowing. I lay awake nights wishing to find the perfect lens an instrument of great magnifying power. Such a lens would permit me to see life in the smallest parts of its development. I was sure that a powerful lens like that could be built, and I spent my second year in New York trying to create it. I experimented with every kind of material, I tried simple glass, crystal, and even precious stones, but I always found myself back where I started. My parents were angry at the lack of progress in my medical studies. I had not gone to one class since arriving in New York. Also, I had spent a lot of money on my experiments. One day, while I was working in my laboratory, Jules Simon knocked at my door. He lived in the apartment just above mine. I knew he loved jewelry, expensive clothing, and good living. There was something mysterious about him, too. He always had something to sell, a painting, a rare statue, an expensive pair of lamps. I never understood why Simon did this. He didn't seem to need the money. He had many friends among the best families of New York. Simon was very excited as he came into my laboratory. Oh, my dear fellow, he gasped. I have just seen the most amazing thing in the world. He told me 
he had gone to visit a woman who had strange magical powers. She could speak to the dead and read the minds of the living. To test her, Simon had written some questions about himself on a piece of paper. The woman, Madame Wolpes, had answered all of the questions correctly. Hearing about this woman gave me an idea. Perhaps she would be able to help me discover the secret of the perfect lens. Two days later, I went to her house. Madame Volpes was an ugly woman with sharp, cruel eyes. She didn't say a word to me when she opened the door, but took me right into her living room. We sat down at a large, round table, and she spoke. What do you want from me? I want to speak to a person who died many years before I was born. Put your hands on the table. We sat there for several minutes. The room grew darker and darker, but Madame Wolpes did not turn on any lights. I began to feel a little silly. Then I felt a series of violent knocks. They shook the table, the back of my chair, the floor under my feet, and even the windows. Madame Wolpes smiled. They are very strong tonight. You are lucky. They want you to write down the name of the spirit you wish to talk to. I tore a piece of paper out of my notebook and wrote down a name. I didn't show it to Madame Wolpes. After a moment, Madame Wolpes' hand began to shake so hard the table moved. She said a spirit was now holding her hand and would write me a message. I gave her paper and a pencil. She wrote something and gave the paper to me. The message read, I am here. Question me. It was signed, Leeuwenhoek. I couldn't believe my eyes. The name was the same one I had written on my piece of paper. I was sure that an ignorant woman like Madame Wolpes would not know who Leeuwenhoek was. Why would she know the name of the man who invented the microscope? Quickly, I wrote a question on another piece of paper. How can I create the perfect lens? Leeuwenhoek wrote back, Find a diamond of 140 carats. Give it a strong electrical charge. The electricity will change the diamond's atoms. From that stone you can form the perfect lens. I left Madame Volpe's house in a state of painful excitement. Where would I find a diamond that large? All my family's money could not buy a diamond like that, and even if I had enough money, I knew that such diamonds are very difficult to find. When I came home, I saw a light in Simon's window. I climbed the stairs to his apartment and went in without knocking. Simon's back was toward me as he bent over a lamp. He looked as if he were carefully studying a small object in his hands. As soon as he heard me enter, he put the object in his pocket. His face became red, and he seemed very nervous. 
What are you looking at? I asked. Simon didn't answer me. Instead, he laughed nervously and told me to sit down. I couldn't wait to tell him my news. Simon, I have just come from Madame Volpi's. She gave me some important information that will help me find the perfect lens. If only I could find a diamond that weighs 140 carats. My words seemed to change Simon into a wild animal. He rushed to a small table and grabbed a long, thin knife. No, he shouted. You won't get my treasure. I'll die before I give it to you. My dear Simon, I said, I don't know what you are talking about. I went to Madame Volpe's to ask her for help with a scientific problem. She told me I needed an enormous diamond. You could not possibly own a diamond that large. If you did, you would be very rich, and you wouldn't be living here. He stared at me for a second, and then he laughed and apologized. Simon, I suggested, let us drink some wine and forget all this. I have two bottles downstairs in my apartment. What do you think? I like your idea, he said. I brought the wine to his apartment, and we began to drink. By the time we had finished the first bottle, Simon was very sleepy and very drunk. I felt as calm as ever for I believed that I knew Simon's secret. <laughs>